uh, and for this, and for this, I I guess that you've been looking at um, the um, diagnostic uh, uh, protocol and the the diagnostic scenarios and the model comparison protocol from World Package One. And uh, in this session, we're going to do something that is very similar because we're still uh, doing model comparisons, but the model comparisons are a bit different because now we are not comparing models within the same class, but across the spectrum of, of what can be done. So it's not only uh, one integrated assessment model versus another, but one integrated assessment model versus an energy system model. But this philosophy actually can be also applied to comparing energy system models to more detailed sectoral models. We will discuss later in the presentation. Um, the agenda that we're gonna follow today is first, I would like to um, talk a little bit about why we need uh, different model types and we cannot get accurate analysis and accurate um, calculations for uh, policy making if we stay within the range of integrated assessment models there are many things that they do not capture so we need different types of models but we cannot use them uh, individually but uh, we need to link them and uh, and that is why i would spend uh, a little bit of time explaining how we link models of different types and uh, uh, how we need to structure this linking so that we can get as accurate uh, conclusions as possible. Then, whenever we, we use different models, uh, we do not arrive to identical results. And this is something that, that you guys have been, uh, have been looking at in your um, workshop with, with Will. So in this case, it will not be different. Actually, it will be worse because right now the scope of the models is also different. We will get some discrepancies and we will give you some guidelines about how the discrepancies arise and how we can understood them, understand them. Uh, also, I will uh, be more specific about the features of the models that set them apart and that are the source of the, of the discrepancies. And when all this has been clarified, then we will start with the case study, which is where you guys start to work. And uh, for this, we're gonna have uh, the help of uh, Hauke Henke and uh, from Emir Feitik. And uh, they're gonna be showing how we get the data. You've been already presented with the Scenario Explorer. So we're gonna download data from the Scenario Explorer. Don't worry, we will share an Excel file with you. So even if uh, the SNA expert doesn't work for you right now, um, you will still get the data to carry out the exercise. And uh, with Emir, we will use uh, some uh, uh, interactive software so that we can share the insights that emerge as you carry on the exercise. Um, and those insights are going to be directly uh, related to uh, the topics that we have been discussing. So where are the discrepancies? What is the best way to carry out the model comparison and so on. Um, then after the case study has been completed, we're gonna give you some, uh, well, has been completed, has been tried by you for a while. So we will give you uh, some minutes to work, um, preferably in pairs. So I can see that some of you are, are already sitting down in pairs. If not, it might be a good idea for you to, to look for a partner. Um, of course, groups of three are, are also welcome. The access, or, or you can stay on your own as well. Um, but pairs would be preferred. And after you have tried that, we will give you some, um, some specific guidelines on how uh, you can do these comparison exercises better. And uh, uh, we will try again see your results and discuss a little bit to wrap it up with the uh, conclusions. Now coming um, to, the, uh, to the reason for this seminar, for this workshop, why do we need several model types? Well, in case anyone needs a reminder, but this would be like a, a 
preaching to the choir, right? Because it's all modelers here. We need models because we need to plan for the energy transition. And in the energy transition, many things are gonna are gonna change. Uh, you will, uh, I bet you are mostly uh, acquainted with, with these scenarios with distributed energy and global ambition, ambition from um, uh, the PYNDP. And, uh, uh, and as you can see, the uh, share of renewable is set to, in any case, uh, increase dramatically. And uh, this is going to have uh, a very deep impact, not only on the um, electricity system and the energy system as a whole, but also in the economy, uh, as there are so many uh, interrelationships that we need to consider. So we really need energy system models to evaluate um, what is going to what is going to happen. So in any of these scenarios, as we said, a lot of renewables, many, uh, many changes. And uh, if we don't have mathematical models uh, to really evaluate the, the different possibilities that we have to arrive to this uh, uh, low carbon future, we won't be able to make good policy decisions. So basically, uh, we know that we're going to arrive or we know that we want to arrive to a place with a very low carbon, but there are many different ways to arrive there, uh, many different pathways. The pathways that are best need to be evaluated in a comprehensive way so that we can determine what is the future that we want and what is the uh, most efficient policy that will leave, uh, that will let us there. Okay, so for these mathematical models, um, we need to be very wary of, uh, of their features, their classification. So just very quickly, even though we will touch on this a little bit um, later in more detail, I would like uh, to just uh, insight that, the, the, um, um, that it is uh, very important from the very beginning to have a clear idea of their technical and economic detail. So for instance, we can have top-down models such as uh, um, general equilibrium models, which are going to uh, be able to capture very well the macroeconomic uh, relationships, for instance, but uh, will lack some of the technological representation that is needed. Um, but then we have other types of models, bottom-up models, that are gonna have um, a higher detailed uh, technology representation. There you have uh, several examples but in the ECMF uh, suit, you have uh, many different uh, models. And there's been other presentations um, focusing on the, on the different models that you have available. Also, we need to uh, consider what is the approach that is, that is used uh, mathematically. And uh, we can either see uh, for, a, for a pathway that we define what is the cost, by a simulation. Mostly we're going to simulate different um, scenarios or different uh, snapshots. The difference between um, a scenario would be that the scenario defines long-term uncertainty, such as uh, how many, um, how much renewables we have, or whether there is um, a nuclear or not, things that are in the wide uh, range. And uh, the snapshots, and we refer to the, the different operation situations for, for, the, uh, for the system. The, the most detailed operation models will take into account every, all the hours in the year and, uh, and they will simulate what happens in the system for, for, this, uh, um, for each of these individual uh, hours. We can also have uh, optimization and in optimization models, what we're going to have is that the capacities are uh, optimized. We get the, the optimal investment, the best investment that we can consider. And um, we have a, a mixture of models there. Also, we're going to have uh, to deal with different um, spatial and, and temporal scopes. And uh, here, for the time scope, we can have models that are maybe very detailed, as, uh, as I was mentioning, that, that maybe I can take into account all the hours in the year. But then 
they will uh, only look at one year and other models that are going to be more coarse, but uh, can look at the very long term, even uh, 100 years in, in, some of the, in some of the cases. And uh, along the same lines, we're going to have different uh, spatial um, resolution in the, in the models. We can have models that are global and describe um, all the world. We can have regional models. And uh, with regional, we, we can refer to um, one Europe as one region or Europe as uh, two region uh, or even countries. We will discuss this a little bit later, or we can have local models that are going to focus on, on a very uh, much smaller scale. So basically, um, we're going to be facing a lot of challenges uh, that come from uh, um, decarbonization. And just to, um, to keep all of, this, all of this in mind, we're going to have some of them that have to do with uh, the economy as a whole or with aspects that go uh, a little bit beyond the energy system. And then we're going to have some other aspects that uh, stay within the energy system. Uh, for instance, the need for flexibility is, uh, is one that, that comes from the, uh, from the energy system. And uh, as you know, the more renewables that we have, renewable penetration, needs to have uh, uh, some uh, flexibility support. And, uh, and actually, flexibility is one of the main reasons why uh, we need to increase our temporal um, granularity. So if we are just describing the operation of the system with uh, a few snapshots, then we won't be able to capture the need for flexibility that happens in the very short term. This is very important when we compare the results of integrated assessment models with energy systems models, because um, the um, needs that we find for flexibility are going to be different um, for one and for and for the others. By the way, I don't know if um, if it is possible for me to interact directly with you. So just to make sure, because this is a, this is not a very good time. And uh, um, so, and you have already had lunch, right? So right after lunch is not the best uh, time. So to make sure that everyone is is paying attention, maybe I can ask a couple of questions to the audience. Yes, we can interact with you. We would just need to hand around the micros, Sarah. Ah, that's great. That sounds great. So can I ask? There is someone. Let me. Um, so in the the first row. There is someone wearing a green T-shirt. The Will. I can see. Is that Will? It's Will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's too small that I cannot. Uh, so Will, can you choose someone at random, please? Sorry, could you repeat yourself? Can you choose someone at random, please, to ask just a question to keep to keep this flowing and to keep people active? You want me to pick someone at random? Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Because I cannot, I cannot see the faces. I can just see that there is people there. I love your style, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, if uh, if I ask about flexibility, what is your 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 reaction? If I ask you, what model, uh, what model, and why is going to be able to? Um, uh, correctly assess the need for flexibility, or what is going to be the different in the as the difference in the assessment of flexibility uh, carried out by an integrated assessment model and an energy systems model? Well, at least in uh, in case of energy system models, it's like time resolution is hourly, or could be even less, like mm -hmm. quarterly. Yeah. Um, and this is not the case for inter uh, integrated assessment models, of course. And this is where the bottlenecks of the system will be appeared. And it's good to consider them in IMs. Precisely. So all the need that we have for, uh, for instance, what are, what are the what are the technologies that you are going to to see a higher need for in energy systems models? To be more specific. 
the technologies that have to do with flexibility. Are you, sorry, Sarah, are you asking another question? Uh, yes, yes. So I was asking a follow up question. Oh, so, okay. You're still so, what on are the, the technologies? Yeah, you're still on there. Thank you, by the way, for, for participating. Uh, Gladly. So, <laughs> so, what are the, the technologies that we're going to see a higher use, use of in energy systems models? Well, of course, transportation is part of it, but on top of that, there are topics on batteries or storages, okay, hydrogen good. storages, very good, or seasonal storages. That depends. They are all flexible. storage, yeah. So or all generally. storage in general, all yes. storage in general is going to be um, more used in in uh, energy systems models. And if uh, instead of having just two models, we were to have three. So imagine that we were um, looking at one integrated assessment model with one energy system model, and then the energy system model coupled with a sectoral model, which is uh, the exercise that we carry out at ECMF as well, uh, then the need would be even higher in the, in the sectoral uh, model, in the electrical model. Uh, okay. Um, with uh, uh, electrification, we have there the icon of the of the electric vehicle. So basically, the same the same is gonna happen in the electric system. In, sorry, in the energy system model, we're gonna have a more detailed description of what happens with EVs, and uh, actually, even just uh, changing the the loading profile of EVs can have uh, a drastic impact, even with the same penetration different uh, charging profiles can have a, a very deep impact on further need uh, of flexibility for, for the system. Um, so for instance, right now in, uh, in World Package uh, A3, uh, we're having uh, surprising results that we haven't yet uh, shared that have to do with these just very slightly different assumptions for um, EV charging profiles. Uh, can lead to widely different uh, results. So what the system can take depends a lot on what is the, the charging strategy. We have emergence of new technologies. Um, obviously, we're going to have more technologies described in energy system models. Uh, for instance, can, can you give a, an example of what can happen with, with technologies? Uh, Will, can you pick someone else at random? Well, does, does anyone have a... Have an idea. New technologies. Want to... uh, hydrogen turbines. Maybe in the future we can use them. Yes. Mm. And, uh, a fuel cell. That, that would be one. Uh, sorry, uh, can you say that again? Uh, a fuel cell technologies also in the uh, transportation. Yes. Yes. In transportation, there are many, um, many new technologies that, um, that are uh, currently uh, being considered. Um, even um, and, and, uh, in, in some cases, uh, with uh, very different uh, uh, perspectives depending on the scenario. So in the electrification of uh, load transport, for instance, we can have very widely different uh, assumptions. So it is true that in transportation there are many, uh, many new technologies. Same thing uh, with uh, with heating, um, with uh, some uh, some um, technological solutions such as district heating, uh, having again very widely different uh, assumptions. We don't have a, a clear idea of what is going to happen. Even um, geothermal um, is is uh, something where where people cannot. Um, cannot seem to get their assumptions uh, too much, um, but there is there is also another uh, there's also an, another topic related to this, which is where is the technological description more detailed in the in energy systems models on or in uh, integrated assessment models? Obviously, in the in the former in energy system models, and this is going to also uh, have some uh, impact on the on the results. Um, also, other other topic that is uh, uh, crucial is decentralization. As you have there, uh, some solar PV on on um, uh, 
well, this this can be anything. I I was thinking of a rooftop, but but it can be it can be anything really. So with when we talk about decentralization, what are the main issues that that come to play in in energy in energy system models that cannot be captured uh, in integrated assessment models? Again, another another question. I like uh, Will's style uh, on picking a, a random person, but I, I like it better for the looking for volunteers. So if someone else can um, can interact, so what is the what is the issue with decentralization and what is what is it so important when we are dealing with these models? Um, I think the geographical spread of where is the demand and where is the supply matching that uh, can be a challenge with decentralization. And mm -hmm. also maybe how the institutes are like who is buying the electricity. Um, uh, is it making business sense for them for for the utilities to buy decentralized electricity, which can be at times more expensive? Awesome, awesome. So uh, the the main issue is gonna have with is gonna uh, come with the geographical spread, and uh, if we want to actually consider precisely how things are gonna happen, we would need to have models that uh, include, for instance, the transmission network and the distribution networks. And those are much more complex. So those those would be in the scope of uh, sectoral models. Remember what what we were describing about having integrated as the model and the and the sectoral model at the bottom, um, because the only way of uh, accurately capturing the impact of this decentralization is uh, uh, by incorporating the, the geographical location in a um, in an accurate manner with all the network um, constraints. And also, as you were mentioning, this is going to change how um, agents uh, interact in a, a, from an economic uh, perspective uh, as well, um, which ties really well with the uh, three aspects that you can see here in a little bit of a lighter color, because uh, uh, they are not precisely in uh, related to to energy but are but are there uh, so things that that are changing are of course the efficiencies in all technologies so we have uh, mentioned several of them but but this is uh, applied to to everything the macroeconomic interactions are going to be uh, also uh, something that is very important for us to to analyze that is why a uh, very um, the idea is for integrated assessment models to have a much wider um, geographical scope to be able to capture the, the flows between a region and in many cases uh, it was, um, they they are able to to do this uh, with even mod some models being global which is the, the ideal to capture all these macro interactions and all the flows that happen in not only in terms of uh, energy, but of course, in terms of commodities and products and services. And um, also the role of uh, uh, consumer behavior is going to uh, be determinant. And uh, this links to things uh, such as the, the EV prof charging profile that I was sharing before. So um, the, the way that consumers adopt new technologies is going to adopt new technologies and, and use the available technologies is going to be um, key to see what can uh, the, the future pathways uh, to, uh, um, to a zero carbon or to a low carbon future be. So as, as you could see, uh, I had included here a citation, which is that basically it would be very nice to include all the features of, of systems into one model, but it doesn't seem like, like this is possible. So what we do is that we link um, several, several types of models. So the idea is that in order to get accurate analysis, we will be using, in many cases, three of them. So the integrated assessment model, the energy system model, and then to focus on some of the stuff, um, we could need a sectoral uh, model. If we want to get um, a higher level of detail on how the distribution network is affected, by the way, uh, for instance, or how is um, heating going to uh, change in, um, in a specific uh, zone or area, or how uh, the technologies are going to be uptaken. 
this uh, would be better than by a sectorial model. So uh, with this uh, framework, we're going to have our um, integrated assessment model, which is going to um, give us the interdependencies with uh, the whole economy. Uh, then our energy system model is going to uh, give us uh, some uh, um, wide panoramic on the energy system with uh, technological use, which is um, quite approximate and will incorporate uh, consumer behavior in an approximate way as well. And then some operational aspects that are more detailed are going to be taken into account by the sectoral model. But in this case, uh, we're going to be focusing on the link of the previous two. I um, wanted to talk a little bit more about linking, which is uh, an issue that, um, that it is very shocking to me that uh, haven't, uh, hasn't been uh, more explored in the literature in a more formal way. If you search uh, for papers to describe different uh, ways of linking or different formalizations of linking, you will not find a lot of papers. You can go um, into the um, website uh, for uh, ECMF. You have uh, for um, um, Word Package 7, you have a, a library with the most important references and some uh, also some other uh, documents that will help you organize your linking between uh, two different models. And, uh, and this is quite an advance with uh, what used to be there, uh, which uh, used to be something um, done on a case-by-case -case basis and without that much of a formalization. So um, what I would like to show are the different ways in which we can link uh, the models. In this, uh, can you see my mouse, by the way? Yes. Ah, great. So in the legend, we have different colors. The, the global would be the integrated assessment model, the system would be the energy system model and sectoral model. So one way of using models is just uh, using them independently. Uh, when we say independently, it, it doesn't seem, um, it doesn't mean to use them in an unrelated way, but they would be solving, for instance, the same scenarios. So we will show the, um, send the same scenarios to the different models, and then we can compare the results. Then we can um, link the, the models. And there are two ways, in which two main ways in which we're gonna uh, link the models. One of them is uh, through um, hard linking, and then the other one is soft linking. With hard linking, what we mean is that the two models are going to be uh, linked um, by uh, by code, so they will be operated operated in a concurrent way. So uh, for the person operating the models, they will uh, be as one model. Uh, however, the two models have been developed in an independent manner, and they are just uh, uh, put together at a later stage of the development. This is what we know as hard linking, and is not. Uh, what is usually done, or at least what we modelers do. In some other um, uh, in some other disciplines, hard linking uh, is uh, is more common. But for us, energy modelers, we normally deal with soft linking. So we're gonna have still the models um, retain their individuality, and uh, they are operated individually. However, they exchange data, and in the data exchange. We need to uh, standardize uh, the way that we express these uh, um, these variables and parameters, and that is why we make use of uh, systems such as the Scenario Explorer, which is uh, um, one great uh, advantage. Or it uh, what I mean is that it has been one great step towards uh, uh, sharing data in a standardized way. So. In, in soft linking, we can have soft linking that happens in one direction. So for instance, between the integrated assessment model, normally we go um, from the uh, more general to the more specific. So we will get some um, data that is processed by the uh, integrated assessment model. 
and is given to the energy system model. So this would be unidirectional, and there are several exercises in ECMF where you can see um, this, this example uh, behavior. Usually what is going to happen is that we get a general perspective of the whole economy with the integrated assessment model, and then the energy system model focuses on the energy sector and uh, uh, gives a more accurate picture. However, this unidirectional um, uh, solution is not always uh, is not always good. Why? Because imagine that uh, we find when we um, when we play with the energy system, sorry, with the energy system model, that our solution is not uh, is not feasible, or that, for instance, as we were discussing earlier, the needs for flexibility that were considered in the in the integrated assessment model, and this is the most common occurrence, they are too low. So when we go into the energy systems model, um, they need to be modified. So what we we'll need to do is that we will build one of these um, loops where uh, the integrated assessment model will give us some solution that will then be refined by the energy system model. And this will be fed back to the integrated assessment model. This is also very, um, very common in the literature. And it is important that we are very clear on what are the variables that are uh, shared between the model and what are the convergence criteria. Because very often, it's not so easy to, um, to converge here. Uh, may I ask how many of you have had already experience with soft linking, and uh, how many of you have um, um, have had the issue that I'm talking about when designing a, a convergence criteria? Maybe the first question: How many of you have uh, already worked with soft linking? I assume that no one will have worked with hard linking. Yeah, looks like we've got about ten hands up for soft linking. Okay, can you ask uh, uh, people please to uh, share in in a couple of uh, sentences very very quickly what has been their overall experience and what were the main challenges that they faced? Okay, anyone want to share soft linking headaches? So I wanted to mention that in case of soft linking, change of APA would be uh, problematic, especially when you read some uh, data for, uh, or um, outputs from another model. And if they change the APA and you, your model still works with the old APA, then it's problematic. Mm. Then you have to resolve the issue and adapt it. Yep. Yep. More? Thank you. Probably cannot see me because the camera is not covering my face. But for me, actually, oh, yeah. most of the issues were related not to, to the APIs and the different way that they take the data, but the different understanding of some variables between the Very two good. models. Very good. That is, uh, um, that is one of the main uh, headaches that can happen because the assumptions that, that uh, models work on can be very different. And even the definition of the variables can be different. That's why having a, a, a clear definition is is uh, is key. Is key. And, and, uh, and yeah, of course, it can be it can be a big headache. Uh, do we have more comments? Yeah, uh, it was a while ago, but I had issues with the definition of time steps, especially when there is storage involved. So, like if one model doesn't define the energy storage at a given time step the same way the other does, then it's not consistent. It, it, it can be a nightmare. Mm, so with time steps that were not uh, consistent, but that is uh, when you were using models uh, that, so you were soft linking energy system models, not one integrated assessment model with an energy system model, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. okay, understood, understood. Um, we will talk about the harmonization of, of time granularity. Yes, of course, this this is this is uh, also a very important point. Do we have more uh, comments? I mean, just a quick note, we talked about uh, semantics of data um, and sort of the meaning of different variable names and misunderstandings a bit this morning. And it's mm -hmm. it's something that's a common, it's a theme at OpenMod, I guess. Um, there's there's some work on, on this, so we can report yeah. back on, on this aspect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, basically, um, in... Those are the, the 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 things that happen in the reality of of soft leaking, and uh, even if uh, if you have worked in many different projects, soft linking integrated assessment models with energy system models, there will be uh, issues when linking uh, one model to another that hasn't been linked in the past. So the only way where we can uh, feel safe is when, when we have worked with the same model in the past and uh, and we know precisely yeah, those semantics, those assumptions, uh, the format that that uh, that is in the data and uh, and everything has been smoothed um, out in a previous exercise. By the way, I didn't mention this, but there's also a way, um, another way to link models, which is the uh, endogenous um, linking and in endogenous linking, what we would do is uh, to to get uh, the constraints of the uh, energy system into the integrated assessment model. So it's like building a bigger model, uh, which is uh, this is not considered linking by by many people. It would be like making the model grow, but this is not usually what we do. In the same way that hard linking is not usually what we do, we work with soft linking. And by the way, this um, this will be expanded in a in a paper that will come uh, that will come very soon from uh, a, one of our um, a colleagues at at Comillas, who is also working at uh, ECMS. So now we've said uh, that we need to work with uh, with different models, and we know that we're going to link them, and there can be some problems. Uh, but the main thing here is that even when we have solved these problems and the two models linked by sublinking, there can be discrepancies in the results. So uh, even when we are only uh, in the spectrum of uh, integrated assessment models uh, covering the same um, uh, the same aspects of uh, of reality and of the economy the results will be different. And uh, this morning, uh, I bet you had a, a very interesting discussion with Will uh, about the model comparison within integrated assessment models. So the results, even when we put the same scenario, and even if the models have the same scope, will not be the same. But we need to see if they are consistent because uh, there might be uh, some uh, errors in the way that we have uh, the data that is, uh, that is fed to the model or, um, um, or other sources of discrepancy that need to be cleared up. But after those have been uh, cleared up, there will be still some discrepancies that are remaining. So what are the, the main uh, sources uh, for discrepancy. I'm going to uh, read you this list, which is uh, uh, something that is not comprehensive, and then I'm going to ask you to elaborate, uh, based on your experience, which one of these is most important and uh, uh, which one has been the most relevant for you. So, for instance, we can have differences in the way that scenarios are, uh, are described. So maybe the, the assumptions are not precisely the same, the data is not precisely the same, the one that is, that is given to, to the model, uh, or even the, the representative snapshots that we use, even for demand. So if we are dealing with uh, one demand that is uh, um, static, and we have one constant demand for the scenario, and we compare that to one where we have a, a hourly description, then that is going to be uh, very different. Uh, even if uh, if we have uh, the same number of snapshots, 
if they have been uh, built using different techniques, uh, for instance, uh, in many cases, we use um, K uh, methods or other clustering methods to select our snapshots. They, uh, those snapshots will not have uh, um, the same um, average result than looking for hourly data. Um, would you be able to, to, uh, to say why? Can anyone uh, maybe, maybe touch on this? Imagine that I have a hourly description and then I get the representative snapshots using clustering. Why will the result be different? Anyone into clustering? Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you repeat the question, Sarah? Just again. Uh, so, um, imagine that I have one model that considers um, hourly demand, and in the other one, uh, I have only some representative snapshots. They can be many snapshots, and they have been selected by a clustering. Why, when I use clustering, my result? Uh, for instance, uh, as operation cost will not be the same as when using hourly data, even if they are representative and uh, I make sure that the average demand is, is still good and, and everything. You hear me, Sarah? Yeah. Yes. So um, it might be due to, due to the fact that you choose to cluster on a very low number of clusters and the extremes such as the peak demands might be different from the hourly data, which is then of higher resolution and which covers those peaks. So the investment strategy of the model might alter depending on the sets of demand data that you're using. Precisely, precisely. So the difference is gonna come from these extreme scenarios that are not usually not going to be sufficiently represent, represented in our clustering. Some people, if you guys are into clustering, uh, some people, uh, what they do is that they pollute the scenario tree. This pollution is uh, is very often done by including extreme scenarios that wouldn't have been picked by the clustering or increasing the weight that we give to these uh, extreme scenarios. Um, however, uh, the, only, the only way in which we can be uh, completely sure that we are um, that we are dealing with a, a set of snapshots that is as representative as possible is to compare not only in terms of demand but also in terms of uh, operation cost, which is going to uh, to reflect uh, better if one scenario is more extreme or if it is not. So those differences in in terms of scenarios, uh, the scenario definition or in, in terms of uh, the representative snapshots are going to be uh, very important. Um, also, the differences in the detail of, of representation of the energy sector are going to be um, very important as well. So for instance, we can have models that deal with different technologies versus models that deal with generating units. Have you guys had uh, the experience of working with, um, uh, with models concurrently that we're dealing with uh, a lamp capacity per technology versus the um, individual generating units? Or does everyone work with a, with a capacity per technology? Could you repeat again, Sarah? So, does everyone work or has everyone been working only with models that um, that deal with an aggregate capacity per technology? Or have you guys had the experience as well of working with models that have the unit detail? So the, a particular plant. Okay, I guess we could do a show of hands. So who works with individual units? when you're looking at the energy system? And who looks at just aggregates for capacities of technologies? Okay, so most people deal with the with the aggregate. Yeah. For the ones that deal with the individual, um, you are looking at models that have the scope of a country, right? 
Yes, I can. I, um, it's not some, that I can feel free. Some yes, some no. But yes, some no. For the for the ones uh, that deal with the specific units, can you guys um, stress the differences between a model that that has the aggregate uh, technology versus the generating units and how uh, you can try to um, balance both of them to make them more consistent? Well, um, I have a mix of power plant representations in my model. So it's a country model with aggregated technologies, but then I also model a hydropower cascade, which is on a per power plant basis. And uh, that is just to be able to um, model water in the model as well as storages. So they are still meeting the same types of demands and their availabilities are differentiated between um, one being limited by a water resource and other one being limited by a capacity factor that is assigned to that aggregated level of technology. Uh, but I wasn't really sure about the question of how, like, you... Yeah. No, the way to try to harmonize them both, yeah. uh, so your capacity factor will be uh, will be one way. So um, you are going to have... So the, the, the main thing that, that will happen is that when we are dealing with specific units, there will be lots of different constraints that we need to take into account. So uh, we won't be able to use them as much as uh, as we would expect if uh, if they are just like adding the the capacity. So um, so we would need to to um, put a little bit down the capacity when we are uh, looking to the aggregate model. So that is that is good. Um, also, um, we were talking about time granularity earlier, so that is that is fine. Uh, and we have been um, commenting a little bit about this these constraints that come from the uh, from the description of the system as units. We're gonna have all the uh, all the constraints that come from the unit commitment. Uh, constraints that, that describe the ramps, uh, maximum and, and minimums, and some of them can be quite quite complex, but we also have the network constraints. Uh, how many of you, just a quick hand, how many of you use models that ha include a description of the network in, in, any, um, in any meaning? So this can be the trans power transmission, or they can be maybe gas if you are... Uh, So five or six hands up? Yeah. Five or six, so not you, many. No. Yeah, so it's like it is uh, most of the models do not include the description of the of the network, but it can be quite uh, um, quite important when we go down to the to the energy systems um, perspective. And uh, as I was trying to um, portray earlier, so all these question about decentralization has a, a deep impact on, on network needs. Uh, one of the, the tasks within World Package 3 is actually looking at this. So you guys will have some uh, results on this uh, calculated with, uh, with models that do incorporate the network uh, very soon. Also, uh, we have been talking about differences in assumptions like profiles uh, or things like that. Um, but another one that we haven't touched upon are the differences in modeling approaches, whether we have linearized or not linearized some of the uh, constraints. Uh, in some of the cases where we have models that are very specific uh, that deal with generating units, they can even include um, constraints that are uh, not linear about the, um, in, even in thermal, but in, in hydro is, is even more uh, more usual, right? So some of you will be will be in this in this case. Um, do you think that I have left out any main sources of discrepancy that you have found in your um, in your day to day work? Anyone? Anything missing in uh, anything missing Sarah's list here? 
Okay, so it seems like the it seems like uh, the the list is fine for now. So now let's go to um, just showing an example. And this is uh, again from a paper that is not yet there, but will be soon available to all of you. And uh, um, and in this uh, uh, in this is Hauka's uh, paper and some other uh, authors from from the project as well. So as you can see here, uh, the the differences in the in the results uh, are quite uh, are quite different. So in in this case. Uh, you can see um, total energy and uh, electricity. Well, in this case, electricity uh, uh, produced by solar power. So the differences are quite large. And as I was saying, they can be primarily larger than the differences that we have in integrated assessment models, because we have more sources of discrepancy. If we go back here, and this is just to make you realize what we are doing. So the, the exercise that you were carrying out this morning with Will, there were discrepancies, but the discrepancies couldn't come from all this that we were um, uh, that we were uh, discussing because the the um, the details of the representation are going to be much more similar between models that have the same uh, the same scope. Okay. Now, um, just to um, to be to be more specific on these differences, I would like to have very clear the the scope of the model features that are going to define uh, our energy system model and our integrated assessment model. This is going to come also in a in a paper that will come very soon. But this is very familiar for all of us. So basically, when we compare uh, the models, and again, let me come back. I'm sorry to be uh, moving from one slide to another. But these sources of discrepancy, the idea is that they could emerge. So they, they should not be something that surprises us when we start um, comparing our models and searching for the, the root causes of discrepancy. but there should be something that emerge as soon as we start uh, with the exercise of the comparison, because we are going to look at the two models that we will be comparing, and we will set out their features, and we will contrast them. Okay, so these two tables should be a way of making um, the discrepancies uh, obvious before we even start the exercise. So we will be looking at what is the decision scope of the model and uh, the time structure. So basically, we're going to have models that go uh, to a longer or a short-term horizon. Uh, also, we will uh, get different time resolutions, OK? And uh, different time structures, which is something that uh, we haven't discussed yet. So we can have one static model, which is going to just look at the horizon, and this is it. We're going to have myopic um, models that uh, get the result for that moment in time, and then the next one, but there will be no um, joint optimization of the different uh, time, uh, uh, time posts, or a dynamic model, which is going to take into account uh, all the possible evolution at the same time and optimize for that. So this would be what can happen with the with the time, and uh, this will include things such as the process in which we we have uh, designed our snapshots. So differences in in the snapshot characterization of an important variable such as demand is gonna have is gonna come here. Also, we're gonna have our geographical scope and the uh, and the geographical granularity. So um, we're going to go from the global to the local. And uh, the granularity can be, for instance, a transmission nodes. This will be one geographical scope that will be very detailed. Or maybe we have one node per country 
which is going to be less detailed, or maybe we're going to just uh, have two zones uh, per uh, for all the whole Europe, as we will see in, in one example uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Then we're going to uh, check what is the technological scope. Usually in the energy system model, we're going to deal with, with all of this. And, uh, and they will have different uh, levels of, of detail. And in most, uh, in most of them, we will also uh, have, for instance, hydrogen uh, added here. Okay. So uh, checking with this, we will get into uh, more details. So for instance, in the technological scope, we will check uh, what are the technologies that are included. Uh, examples of, of this that we have mentioned uh, already. We were talking about the emerging technologies in, in transport, uh, what happens with uh, electric uh, trucks, for instance. Uh, what happens with your thermal? This is something that we have discussed uh, as well, that there were many different assumptions for cost and for uh, the potential for, for capacity. Uh, there are many, many different technologies that we're going to uh, include or not, and also the, uh, the description of this technology with the constraints that are associated. So with this, we would get the technological granularity, and hopefully we will be able to anticipate the discrepancies that are going to appear, even if we don't anticipate how much the discrepancies are going to be, at least we should be able to anticipate, uh, in many cases, the direction. So for instance, if, uh, um, if I get a system cost that is uh, lower in my energy system model, that, uh, uh, well, uh, energy system cost that is lower in my energy system model than in my integrated assessment model, I should be suspicious because I'm including more constraints, I'm including uh, more time granularity, I'm including more stuff. So if I get a result that is cheaper, then it means that something is off about the assumptions that, uh, that I am using. Okay, so right now uh, we have seen um, uh, or we have talked about the introduction for comparisons, and we have given, I think, a, a simple but, but comprehensive uh, framework. And uh, we're, we're going to start with the exercise. I'm going to give the floor to um, Hauke, and uh, he's going to show you how to download the data uh, and how to download the data from the event page and also from the platform. But the idea is that you're going to get an Excel file, which has this this format, and uh, uh, you're going to get two data sets, one that comes from an integrated assessment model, of course, and the other one from an energy system. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now I will share my screen for a second. Yeah. Okay, one second. So now, yes, please. So Amir just shared in the Zoom. Um, uh, chat um, a link to the um, event page of IASA um, when you're on this page so in case you're not on zoom you can also just go to the event page the link you can find it on the open mod forum um, there is this orange box here not very far down so don't start scrolling down and there's a link to the download so from there you get an excel file as Sarah just showed it while you're doing that, maybe you can quickly also say Sarah is going to later share a link to the GitHub repository on how to download this data or even yeah other data sets from um, that are results from the um, ECMF um, model comparison. Um, and this link will give you uh, access to a GitHub repository where there's a simple Jupyter notebook. Um, I can just switch to the Jupyter Notebook. Um, wait a second, why is it not sharing it? Um, mm -hmm. One second, stop share. I just start sharing again. Um, yeah, there we go. So it's really, it's not magic. One will, just needs a 
Python environment where PyAM is installed. I then here define the yeah two models that I'm interested in, a set of variables. It, um, Will this morning showed um, how many variables there are available and um, the scenario. Currently there's, I'm not sure if um, any other scenarios have been published, but in the coming weeks and months, we will um, populate this database, um, which is also available with an interactive um, interface called Scenario Explorer. But in case you want to play more in depth with the scenario, uh, with the data, um, this is a good way to do so. And with the PyM data um, Py Python package, you um, yeah, can connect to it and download the data and yeah, so I hope you managed to download the Excel file and um, back to you, Sarah. Sarah? Yes, thank you. So um, I'm gonna just uh, uh, give it a minute so that you guys can download the data. So right now, without saying anything else, what we would like to ask you is the following for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, maybe more than 15. Uh, could you play with the data? Uh, we suggested you to, um, to collaborate in, in pairs, uh, but as I said before, please feel free to, to do it in groups of three or, or even on your own, whatever you prefer. And the idea is um, imagine that you are uh, now working with, uh, with those two models that appear in the, in the data. And you want to, um, to basically answer the question that gives the title to this uh, workshop. So are your results consistent? What do you think? Do you think that there is something um, wrong going on or uh, the results make sense? Uh, and you can structure the comparisons in the way that you, um, that you see fit and you can use any tools that you um, that you find interesting. So we're gonna uh, give to you, yeah, 10, 15 minutes, and uh, and we will reconvene in 10, 15 minutes. And in the meantime, uh, we will be available for any question that you might have. Hello. Uh, so we have prepared a mirror board where you can collaborate two and two. Um, we have 10 groups so far, um, but I'm guessing we're more than 20 people here. So I will just copy more of those uh, boards. And um, yeah, that's what you were thinking, right, Sarah, that they start with the mirror already now. Ah, yes, yes. So yeah. that is yeah. that is very good. I was I was gonna um, suggest you to to um, start inputting the data or inputting your insights into the mirror board uh, in a bit when you have the comparisons. But but you can uh, you can start uh, already right now. So the important thing with the in the mirror board you have a, a couple of questions or three questions and then one part where you can share insights. Uh, you can look at the data first and then respond to those uh, questions and uh, and we will share the insights that you arrive to in the um, right hand side of the mirror board. Yeah, so for those in the room, we'll share a link to the mirror board uh, on the screen. Um. Oh, you don't. Uh, so you don't need to access the Jupyter Notebook to download the data. Uh, it's just there no, no, no. if you're yeah. interested. Um, for this session, all you need is that Excel workbook. And this links to this morning session because this is uh, data downloaded in the format of the IAMC template. So this is the data interchange format we're using in ECEMF. And yeah, so if you haven't seen this before, it will be might be interesting to to reflect on the yeah what it means to use this this particular format let me just uh, um say it again to in order to clarify so we have prepared the data for you in an excel format which is uh, what Hauke was was showing you uh, that you can load out from from the event uh, page so you you should be able to download it straight away uh, however, we also wanted to show you how to get the data yourselves from the um, from the platform, which uh, which will be very useful for you. And as had been um, 
Uh, very nice. Very nice, Amir. Uh, so, um, as it has been mentioned uh, before, there are some scenarios that you can uh, download now. The, um, the diagnostic scenario, the linear one, is, is there available? And I don't know what else is available right now for the whole uh, community because the, the platform has some more scenarios uh, that are shared within the context of uh, ECMF. Uh, but many more scenarios will be made available for the general public in the coming weeks. So it, it is very interesting for you to get into the platform and to, um, and to download the data. And you don't need to use the Jupyter uh, notebook to download the data. There are other more manual ways of downloading the data if you get into the platform. However, um, it's very useful to do it with the Jupyter notebook. And there are also some tools for model comparison in Jupyter notebooks as well. So it is, it is interesting for you to check what is there, uh, knowing that, that you are working with soft linking and you're working with uh, models with different scopes and, and so on. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, you can also, if, if you want to now, when you are carrying out the, the comparison, if you want to know a little bit more about the models, you can, um, uh, you can check online the, the definition of the model. So for instance, in the, the AMICN, as you have there, uh, there's only two regions, while the, um, the other model that you are comparing to uh, has, uh, has more regions. But um, let's, let's leave it like that, and let's have you looking at the data yourselves. How are you doing? Five more minutes is okay? Yeah, we're, we're doing well. Um, okay, do you some... think that they will be done in five minutes? Or, or is it too rushed? No, I think, I think maybe a bit longer. Okay. If, if that is okay, then um, when uh, continue working and uh, as soon as you have uh, like something that you can share, get into the Miro board. And, uh, and respond in the mirror board. And that can give me a, a good idea of uh, how people are, are doing. But yeah, for now, con continue working. Yeah, you've had, um, you've had a little bit less than 10 minutes. So let's, let's give you a little bit more time. If you create graphs, you can also copy paste them from Excel into Mirror. I didn't know you could do that. That's very cool. And do you need a little bit more time? A couple of minutes or winding up now? Hands up if you need a bit more time. Okay. Sarah, I think we can, uh, we can move on. Very good. Very good. Um, so yeah, and it seems like uh, most of the people uh, have finished. Uh, oh, you can see, you can all see Emir's uh, screen, right? Yes. Okay. So let's uh, uh, let's zoom. So they are telling, we are comparing um, Calliope and the Amicien. Very good. And uh, one main difference is the geographical granularity. So can we maybe ask uh, Arthur to elaborate a little bit more on the differences in granularity, geographical granularity? Okay, hi. Um, so I didn't knew before, I mean, I've never used before Tiam or Calliope, but from what we've seen, um, Tiam is more focusing on a larger scale modeling. So we found that like there is a, you can uh, model and simulate things only in the Europe or North America or South America. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with Calliope, uh, there is more focus that you can, it seems that you can model and run Calliope on either a smaller scale, let's say a city or even larger up to country or even Europe. Okay, and, and uh, within the data that we shared with you, um, yeah. What could you find for the for how was Calliope um, used geographically? Um, so Calliope is used for the European countries. 
very good. Uh, so that was at country level, while Tiami CN was not in country level. It was in, in how many zones? How many uh, regions? So let me just check. Um, I don't know how many. I would say, you know, 10 perhaps. Oh, <laughs> um, less, I, I less. <laughs> less, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I think we're talking about how many regions TM has for Europe, which is ah, okay for Europe. Yeah, okay, I was thinking generally yeah. for Europe. Yeah. Um, so that the only was, one that actually. Was actually yeah. That was actually one of the things that that you needed to do to filter for the results that you could compare. So you you should have filtered only uh, the European uh, regions. Um, how many uh, European regions did we have? For yeah, there, a, a there is only one actually. No. Yeah. True. So we have Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Yeah. Um, um boom, boom, boom. okay, it's here. Um, you have yeah, the, there is Western West uh, Europe and, and East Europe. Um, you 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 can see that in the in the data, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like for the Europe, there is uh, uh, also all European countries, and then there is Euro twenty seven, twenty seven plus EFTA plus UK plus. Yeah, but that is for Calliope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. for so, so for Calliope you have that, and yeah. for the Amisien, uh, you should be seeing two regions. In the in in the spreadsheet, uh, you can see that the two regions are EEU and WEU. Those would be um, those would be the the, the regions. Uh, okay, uh, can can you go back to the mirror board, please? Yeah. Emil? So we can see. Yeah. Can anyone share? Actually, let me. Let me see if I can open it myself. Um, can we see if anyone wants to share any more um, any more information? Because for me, I don't know why, but my mirror board is not is not opening on my laptop. But but it's okay. Uh, so, did you see any um, any other differences other than the the um, uh, geographical coverage? And resolution, sorry. I because could see that Yami emissions Yami. are included in one of them, but not the other one. That okay. was another difference that I found. The variables, so this, this means that the variables do not coincide. Not all variables are, uh, are included. So emissions, we wouldn't be able to compare, but there are other variables that we can compare. What would be the, the most important ones? So for instance, in the MECN, because it's an integrated assessment model, uh, there will be variables that go um, beyond what we're gonna have in, in Euro Calliope, which focuses on, on electricity. Uh, but if we, uh, if we see at what variables appear in both models and we can compare, what can you say? Which ones um, were the, the ones that appear in both of them? We, we can see that the, in the uh, IM model, we, you can have the um, the energy from the old sector. So I guess you model the transport sector, which is not the case from Calliope. Very good. Yes, very good. The transport uh, sector is in the MECN, but it's not in in Calliope because Calliope is focuses on uh, focuses on on electricity. Uh, maybe you can zoom into uh, what Group Three is saying, uh, Emil. Yes, uh, and um, when you kind of answer questions, uh, please state the group name so I can jump to your slides so we can see in, in writing as well. Uh, helpful. Very good. Uh, yeah, so it says the granularity and Europe appeal Calio based on the run for Europe. That is uh, that is very good. Uh, the split between biomass, coal, gas, hydro, nuclear, solar, solar PV. 
and wind, uh, wind uh, onshore and offshore is the same. So this is what I was looking for. So basically, those are the, the variables where we are going to compare, right? Which are the ones that are covered by both models. And they are the production by technology. And also, you have not uh, included this, uh, but there is also the, the variable for electricity demand. And that's it, that is very important. So one of the one of the things that we will um, uh, that we will check first is that demand matches because it's very simple and if demand is not the same then nothing else is going to nothing else is going to be the same. Um, can we maybe check uh, group four, Emir, just very quickly? Group five. Okay, group six. Okay, you say results are completely consistent. I would like to um, insist a, a little bit more in the um, meaning that we're giving the, the names. So results are not identical and they are not supposed to be identical because there are different models. And, uh, and this means that the, uh, that the final numbers that we get are not the same. However, our point is whether the results are consistent or not. And this is a, a, a question that, um, that is not so easy to, to answer. We can see how far some results uh, go from, from the previous ones, but the fact that they are not identical doesn't mean that they are inconsistent. Inconsistent would mean that there is something uh, deep that means that we cannot use them at the same time. And hopefully this is not the case uh, with models that work and scenarios that have been correctly developed. So results should be consistent. And if they are not, then we should check for what is the source of the discrepancies. And uh, there should only be sources that can be smoothed out. If uh, all the discrepancies result from things that are natural or come naturally uh, for the types of models that we are comparing, so in this case, the fact that we have more granularity in Calliope, then this should be fine. So we would say that the results are consistent, however, they are not identical. So I, I would like uh, Carlos and Dumaer to say that the results aren't identical. <laughs> and we don't know yet if they are consistent or not, but, they, but the, the, the good way of phrasing it is, is that they are not identical. Do we have anything else that is worth discussing, Emir? Can we maybe um, hover? Yeah, I've, I've got a few, um, uh, yeah, there are a few points raised when I was walking around the room. So one, one was um, about the regional aggregation and the observation that there are some countries involved in a model region that don't seem to be in another region. And, uh, and I want to make a, a, a flat or uh, advert for a Hauker's poster, which is outside, where you can see the actual exercise we've done in trying to map the regions of all of the different models in this comparison. And uh, the spoiler is that there is a bit of a mess. You know, there are just uh, no, no one, there's no sort of standard agreement among modeling teams on how we should aggregate the European region. And, you know, if we want to aggregate, if if it's too computationally expensive to have like every single country represented and we want say five regions to represent Europe, there's no standard on how to do that. Like every modeling team has their own uh, uh, sort of solution to that. And that makes it very difficult to then compare models at anything other than uh, the sort of whole European level. So that's one point. And then the yeah. other point was... Uh, Oh, uh, Calliope is a detailed energy energy system model, but you know these results don't seem very detailed at all. And oh, this oh. is a this is a very good observation because this is about the limitation of the uh, template. Yes. So what you're viewing here is the result variables that the modeling team has reported that are consistent with the results template. So. Uh, this is maybe another reflection on comparing models, like when we're comparing detailed models, like we actually need to work with the this modeling template, which is or model comparison template, which has been sort of inherited from the integrated assessment modeling community 
but there are many limitations to it when we try and compare much more detailed models. And if we wanted to compare a detailed sectoral model using this comparison template, we would miss a lot of information because it's not just included in the template yet. So this is something that's been actively worked on, but it's these this maybe wasn't immediately obvious from from the information you had today but calliope is actually resolved at a higher spatial resolution than individual countries there are subnational regions in calliope and that's not obvious from the the data you had had there today and the same is for it's aggregated for the platform. One one thing that I would like to add, so in the uh, in the poster that Will uh, told us to to check, you can see how um, they were uh, looking at the different models and and try to come with this puzzle uh, on how to make the regions fit, and it's quite interesting. And uh, um, uh, we'll set to do like some advertising for the papers. I would like to, to say it again, actually, that paper, uh, and I'm not one of the authors, so I can uh, uh, I can say it without uh, uh, feeling like I'm advertising too much. So that paper, it, being in this forum, you really need to, uh, to read it. Uh, and also another upcoming paper on uh, modeling uh, model footprints, that is uh, upcoming by by Mark uh, Degger, also from the from the project, uh, gives uh, also a, a, a very good a very good indication of how to uh, compare models, what are the differences, and whether we can see that there is some sort of profile in the in the discrepancies uh, between the models. Uh, so so all this is uh, is starting to become clear, and uh, I wanted to add as well that even though it seems unreasonable. That um, that the geographical definition is not consistent across models, or the variable definition is not consistent across models. It seems like it's not much bad. However, it's only with uh, these uh, past uh, European projects like uh, Open Entrance and ECMF that this is uh, starting to, to become clear in the pictures, uh, and that there is uh, some consistent effort uh, towards the standardization. So, so it is true that it sounds weird that the regions don't match and many things don't match, uh, but it's because all these models are very complex and have been developed individually. But right now, it's the, the moment in time when we are starting to converge and when we are creating this community, this uh, modeling forum that is, uh, a, that is going to homogenize things so that we can use models in, uh, in the best way possible to gain insight, policy insight in a consistent way. So that is why workshops such as this one are so, so important. Also, uh, I can see uh, more. I can see more info now in the mirror board, but I think it's it's kind of uh, kind of the same. It doesn't seem like uh, there are points that have not been touched upon yet. If there is anyone, is there anyone who thinks that? Um, uh, that there is something that we should have mentioned and we haven't. Can you please uh, uh, share that? There's one hand. Will, didn't, didn't the guy uh, right behind you raise his hand or is it just that I can see very clearly? Um, does, does anyone have any questions, suggestions? Wave now. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. One more. Thank you. Uh, I was looking at the metadata, and I don't know if really this is the final version of the metadata, or is something that for for the purpose of this session is there. Otherwise, it can be more detailed. Uh, for example, how did the regions are defined should be a part of this metadata. So when someone else is coming from outside can have a better understanding just looking at the metadata instead of like spending lots of time going through the documentation that in many cases are not so clear. So yeah, that was my question for metadata. No, it's more it's more like a comment for improvement, right? Uh, I'm not yeah. aware that the metadata was going to be uh, improved. I think yeah, that so right. when you download from the ERL scenario explorer, this metadata is automatically generated. Mm -hmm. And um, so, 
since my poster has been mentioned, it's the first one when you walk out here into the poster area. And um, yeah, that's it's based on the paper that Sarah mentioned. And it's kind of one conclusion that, um, yeah, tools like the Scenario Explorer, it's like one key functionality that is still improvable, or I wouldn't say it's missing, but like it's really something that will improve the usability much more and will also... Um, yeah, make sure or increase the likelihood that these tools and databases will be used also in the future, even after ECMF, for example, has ended is, yeah, that the metadata is a key issue because um, just having the data there without any kind of information what data you have there is, um, yeah, it makes it very difficult to use it. Um, and as soon as people stop working on it, um, nobody is there who can explain. Yeah. Uh, so I I think uh, unless there is something else that I will take over again and I will go back to the to the slides. So remember that um, the idea was that after we have carried out this exercise, uh, we will go back um, to it here. We are back, right, to my slides. You're not in presenter mode. Am I now? Yes. OK. So um, the idea is that now, very quickly, and, and this again refers to the paper that we was uh, mentioning, I'm going to give you a couple of hints uh, for when you need to, to create this, this exercise. And uh, many things have already emerged from the discussion. And by the way, while I'm uh, uh, presenting these uh, last few slides, I would like you to, to still remain into the mirror board and try to make sure that you feel the insights. So what are the, the, in the, in the right-hand side? So what are the most important things that you are going to take away from this session. And this is the, the one that is most interesting for us uh, to, um, to keep. So uh, this structure for comparisons is, uh, is present in, in uh, the paper that we've been mentioned from, uh, mentioning from uh, Hauke. And, uh, and also uh, there's going to be uh, a mention to the, uh, to the model comparison protocol, uh, which um, Will was mentioning this morning, and that you should also uh, get your hands on. So basically, uh, as uh, as we have mentioned, or as Will has mentioned this morning, uh, and we have incited um, on during this presentation, when you use different models, we're going to get different results because of all the sources of discrepancy that we have uh, um, that we have described. Uh, and, uh, and this means that the, the results are not identical, but again, we need to make sure that they are, that they are consistent. And, uh, and as I was mentioning before, in this model, sorry, this paper by Mark uh, uh, Degger is very interesting, and you, can, you will be able to see how um, they define model fingerprints. So basically, when we, I don't know if you have mentioned uh, model fingerprints uh, this morning. Have you, Will? Uh, yes, I did, yeah. And I showed, um, so Mark's paper has now been, with the model fingerprints, has been published as a preprint. So there's a link in my presentation this morning, and I'll, I'll share that. Very good, very good, very good. That's another paper that, that you should definitely um, read. So basically, we have these model fingerprints, the results that we arrive to are not only dependent on the scenario that we, that we include, but also on, on the model. And, uh, and when we go from using different integrated assessment models to now models that belong to different categories, in this exercise, an integrated assessment model and an energy system model, this is, um, this is even more the case. So the very first step that we need to carry out is to harmonize the, um, what we are dealing with. Uh, things that we need to harmonize are first the regions 
and uh, for this you can check uh, the poster outside. Uh, sometimes this uh, harmonization of uh, of regions can be uh, easier and uh, and can be carried out just by aggregating regions very uh, straightforwardly. Some other times it can be uh, a, a real nightmare. And uh, the more detailed models are, uh, the more uh, difficult this uh, harmonization can, can be. But in the case of integrated assessment models with uh, energy system models, hopefully the, the harmonization can be achieved. Then we're going to have to harmonize the variables. And in some cases, we won't be able to make comparisons. And uh, one very important thing that you were commenting when you looked at the data was that we didn't have um, the total emissions for, for both uh, models. And this can be, uh, this can be something that, that, uh, that can have a, a very important consequence, because we won't be able to discuss anything that, that has to do with emissions if we don't get uh, results from a model that can calculate emissions. So in, in this case, uh, if we are using two models and one of them includes them, at least we will have some, some uh, results to anchor the, uh, the discussion. And, uh, and then once this harmonization has been done, we need to compare the, the results. And now we need to see the differences in results, the discrepancy, where they come from. Do they come from a, a parametric course? So this is, a, do they come from scenarios that have been defined in a different way? Or do they come from the a different uh, a natures, the different features of the models that we are comparing? In, in the cases where the cost uh, comes from the input data, then the main idea is that when we uh, see this, we will uh, try to erase this, uh, uh, these differences. So we will try to use the same inputs for both models so that only the uh, structural reasons will, will remain in as much as possible. So, so uh, what is the, uh, the way in which we would structure the, uh, the comparison? And this is the way uh, that we usually work in, the, in ECMF and in other European uh, projects. So basically, we go first to the key parameters. So things like total demand. In this case, total uh, electricity demand or total energy demand, uh, this would, the, tot, the grand totals Will be uh, will be the most important. Uh, also, uh, be aware that the total uh, demand is not going to be um, that having the total demand being the same in both models doesn't seem doesn't mean that the demands are the same per region. So first we check total demand and then we go over to the regions. For instance, in ECMF. Uh, we've seen uh, several instances of total demand fitting very nicely for the European region, but then having widely different um, productions and, and total demands per country. Because you, you might have uh, one country that produces much more and then exports, and the other country is, uh, is having a very large import. We go first to the total, and then we go region by region, in the, in the two models. In the same way, total system cost is very important and emissions. In this case, we couldn't check it, but to, to check whether emissions match is very, um, is very important. And in here is very, um, is, is, uh, is very interesting to look at as early as possible at the discrepancies that can come from uh, these uh, uh, different uh, representative snapshots that we were that we were uh, mentioning earlier. Then, once we have analyzed this uh, total um, demand or total system cost, we're gonna check production, and uh, it makes sense to check production by increasing cost. 
So even if we are, uh, I don't know, imagine that you use the Python notebook that we were mentioning, uh, you use it to, to build some charts. How are you going to inspect the charts? It makes sense to inspect them by increasing production cost. Uh, or at least that, that is what we do and it brings you the most information the quickest. So uh, we should say that nuclear or run of the river should be um, producing mostly the same and any differences that, that come in base technologies should be due to differences in the representation of demand. Then renewables should be very similar. Maybe there is, a, maybe curtailment is, is a little bit different and those differences are going to be absorbed by uh, the uh, flexibility technologies. And in flexibility technologies, we have all the types of storage that we were mentioning. We also have gas, and we should have mentioned here a uh, network, the network. So we can have uh, flows between uh, regions that are going to stabilize those uh, variations that come from renewables. So, so this is, first we check the total amounts, and then we go by increasing costs. And uh, if we do it like this, uh, we would start by nuclear and we will finish with um, non-supplied energy, which would be like the, the highest cost, which is the, is the penalty. Although ideally this should be at zero in, in, the, in the models. And uh, when we check this, we should be uh, always wary of what is reasonable and what is not. So for instance, um, if, uh, if we are dealing with uh, an integrated assessment model and an energy system model, it only makes sense that the energy systems model has a higher need for flexibility than the integrated assessment model and not the other way around. If it is the, way, the other way around, then there is going to be something that is uh, that is wrong. And hopefully with this guide, we should be able to identify in which cases the parameters that are using are a little bit different or uh, if, uh, if the differences come from the different representation of the system that is included in the, uh, in the two models. And uh, also we need to understand that there's going to be some dispersion between uh, the integrated assessment model and the energy system model. Uh, and uh, um, we should consider, if you check the paper on model fingerprints, uh, it's very nice that you are able to see the, um, the intervals uh, that define the, the results for the different model suites, the, or for the different models in the model suite. The dispersion, that appears for integrated assessment models is a lower bound on the dispersion that will appear between an integrated assessment model and an energy system model. So we know that if the differences that we get between the integrated assessment model in terms of these variables, if the differences between the energy system model and the integrated ass assessment model are uh, smaller than the ones that appear in the model fingerprints in, uh, in this exercise, then the differences make sense and, uh, and we can safely assume that unless we have seen something uh, that, is, uh, um, that is weird in this, product, in this uh, comparison variable by variable, the two results are consistent. So let me, let me say it again. The results are not going to be identical. We should never expect them to be identical. But if we have gone through the work that I was uh, showing at the beginning, so let me go back here. So if we go through um, the definition of model features and we compare, we are able to identify how the technological picture that we get is different, the uh, different decision time and geographical scopes, how they are different. And uh, we compare the results in terms of these variables. And we see that there are differences between them, but usually the highest difference is here because the, it's flexibility absorbing all the fluctuations. So if we get 
that the base technologies are very much similar. The renewables are similar, but not so much. Uh, maybe there are uh, different uh, profiles or different uh, descriptions because of the time resolution. And the, the flexibility technologies are more different. If this difference is still within the range of the differences among integrated assessment models, then we can assume safely or quite safely that our results are not identical, but are definitely consistent. Okay, so uh, now I wanted to um, very quickly go through the results for the case study. And uh, in one minute, I would like to um, wrap up with the, uh, with the conclusion. So if you can, as I show this, I'm gonna uh, share a different uh, set of slides. And if you can uh, fill your mirror board with, the, um, with your insights, with what you have learned, then this would be a very nice wrap up. So if you use the Jupyter notebook for comparisons, you would get something like this. And actually the, the notebook is very nice because you can automatize um, a lot of the work that you would be doing. Uh, so as you have seen in the MECN, we have two different zones. The, the two regions are um, very uh, different in terms of size. Eastern Europe is much smaller. And uh, uh, as you can see, the uh, electricity demand is quite different between the two models. So now it, it lets us uh, to wonder whether this is consistent or is it not. Uh, and, uh, and here you can check what is the, the different use of, uh, of technologies. So because there is so much more um, demand included in, in Euro Calliope, we have uh, also a very different mix. So in this case, well, and, and this is uh, by share. In, in this model, we have uh, uh, many more technologies that are that are included. So this lets lets us wonder whether this is actually consistent or not. This is by country, and this is comparing with the uh, with the regions in the scenario. So now, uh, just very quickly before we uh, we finish, uh, I would like to go back to the Mira board and see what you guys have shared in the uh, insights. Or maybe we can just uh, pass the uh, the microphone if you would like to share what is the most important thing that that you have uh, uh, shared in this in this region. Yeah, the uh, the bell is ringing and coffee is waiting. So, we're, yeah, so very I, quickly. Yeah, I guess we've got time for maybe three three one liners. So, would anyone like to? Yep. Uh, I think something that will be quite important as part of the database will be I don't know how to call them, but like interstep aggregation. So, for example, if you have a uh, different types of solar technology in one model and the variables do not match, uh, you need a step that is going to sum them into an aggregate. And you also need to specify that this is an aggregate so that people do not get confused and they can see, okay, this is a model output. And this is something that we are aggregating for uh, intercompati for compatibility in the database. Uh, and you can just easily filter them. Right, I think that would be quite useful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any other takeaways from today's session? Two more? Yep, okay. Thank you. It, it was very insightful also to see all the different aspects that you consider relevant to to look into to to judge whether something is consistent or not. Um, I was still wondering if you say that results are similar. Is there any like quantitative number that you consider um, 
yeah to to justify if something is similar or not is that like because now we we found like 15 percent um comparing this europe and and europe excluding turkey it's not the same but it's not too far off but is that similar yeah so basically uh, the the answer of how much is is two points in terms of uh, difference cannot be um, cannot be answered with a straight uh, number and that is why i was saying that the um, that the paper on model fingerprints is so important because because in the in the in that one we know that this is an exercise that has been carried out using a multiplicity of models and uh, we have arrived to these uh, intervals. So those intervals can serve as the um, as the bound for what is reasonable when comparing integrated assessment models also with uh, energy system models. Uh, so this means that if the difference, if this 15% is below the uh, differences that we find in the uh, model fingerprint uh, paper, and it is, the 15% is reasonable by looking at, uh, at that, uh, then uh, we, can, we can assume that our results are consistent. However, uh, I, I am aware that this might not be a super satisfying answer. Uh, because it's not a, a, a hard number. Uh, also, the the um, uh, the answer should depend on the scenario. We can be more careful, and when we look at model fingerprints, uh, we can be like selecting what happens with the scenarios. And scenarios with higher um, renewable penetration, for instance, will be more dispersed or things like that. So we can refine it a little bit, but the answer is uh, mostly empirical. We check empirically in a suite of models what happens when we are very sure. And if our result differs by less than the empirical exercise that now is available for everyone and it has been carried out in ECMF, now we can uh, assume that the results are consistent. I hope uh, this was uh, uh, clarifying. Yep, thanks. Okay, so uh, I think we can. Did you have some concluding slides, Sarah, or shall we close the session? Um, just very quickly. Uh, let me just very quickly share. So basically, um, so basically, we are uh, going to still need to use an even more uh, um, different models concurrently. And, uh, and as, uh, as we have mentioned um, and repeated several times, we are not striving for identical but consistent results. We have been looking at the potential sources of discrepancy, and there are some of them that we should smooth out, the parametrical ones that, that were described in the paper as parametrical, and the, uh, the ones that are structural. And for the structural, we have this uh, um, this bound that comes from the uh, model fingerprints study. So basically, we are starting as a community of modelers to see uh, the light in terms of uh, how to compare our models, how to use them together, how to harmonize, how to share data using the platform, using uh, open models, and uh, and basically sharing best practices. And uh, and this is only going to uh, going to improve, and uh, and we will be uh, facing this exercise very often in the future to try to arrive to the best uh, uh, pathways towards a, a low carbon future. So thank you very much, and hopefully speak to you again very soon. Great, thanks very much, Sarah, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for attending.